Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you, Sarah. How are you? So good. I am so excited to have you here. I mean, you are an example of everything I champion here on our Woman in Supply Chain series and on Blended. And you're going to be on an upcoming episode of Blended too, which I'm excited for. You're standing up, using your platform to elevate others' voices, building and supporting communities. You really are an inspiration. So thank you so much for finding the time. I know it's been a chaotic time for you to join us on the show. And I can't wait for us to just dive in to everything that we're going to be talking about. So you have achieved so much and I want to take it back to the beginning. Was little Sharon always this ambitious? You know, what was your dream going up, growing up and where did you get the clear drive and passion that you have today? If you go back to my neighbors on Webster street in West Philly, they're going to say <laughs> that girl is going to do something. Or she's going to be something. <laughs> Little Sharon wanted to be a lawyer. So I okay. was all about, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to do corporate law. I wanted to do contracts. What I end up doing, supply chain, working on contracts, <laughs> working with corporations. And so that's what I really wanted to be and what I really wanted to do. And I always kept myself kind of focused on, I'm going to be somebody or do I something. That. I love that. I love that. Where did the drive come from? my mama oh, it's 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 my mama that. my mom worked for the hospital university of penn for 26 years till she retired and she worked as a supervisor for a cleaning company at night and so it was her always having that work ethic of i'm going to get this done she was the first out of her siblings to buy her first house she had her own car that independence that drive that I'm going to get it done type of attitude and I'm not going to let anything stop me. So that's where I get it from, my mom. I love that. Now you have a really impressive education history, degrees, master's certifications, such amazing achievements. And on a recent episode of Blended, we talked about education and we talked about education bias and the fact that access to education is often difficult for certain communities and classes. So how important do you think education has been to your career? What's your perspective as a woman of color on access to education and the emphasis we put on it in the workplace? Vital to every stage of success being a forever learner. I started school in my journey because I knew where I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be a statistic in my neighborhood. It was a pretty rough neighborhood. I knew that education was going to propel me to be successful in my career and in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm a first generation um, college grad out of my, out of my house. Um, I went to Drexel. Um, a lot of that of my journey of where I came from in West Philly and how college shaped me in my career. And I couldn't go forward without doing more and more school and education um, isn't in, in the book. So uh, that's the legacy to share uh, book. I'll tell you about that later. But one thing that I saw through my career is I couldn't move to the next level mm -hmm. without elevating my education level, without mm -hmm. making sure I had that latest and greatest certification. When we go through best practices, what is the best practice for your craft? And for my craft, it was to be educated and trained and to listen to my peers and my elders who told me, go for it, mm. upgrade it. Okay, you got that, now what? So when you went to, was it university? You went straight to university? I went straight, or I had a weird university journey. So, so tell us about the university journey, because I'm curious, right? Because you ended up so, in, you wanted to be a lawyer, you ended yeah. up in supply chain, but what did you actually go to school for? All right. So I started at Penn State, Maine in Happy Valley, right? In State mm -hmm. College. So, you know, Happy Valley. And then I actually was going to school for business. I had, and I was going to go to pre-law, but then I was also always interested in French. And so I always, I took oh. advanced French in high school and I still continued in college because oh. one of my bucket list items when I was 16, I made a bucket list and one of us was go to France. And so oh. I wanted to make sure that happened. And have you I, been? Yes, I have. Okay. I just wanted to make so, sure. So I got the opportunity in our advanced French class at Penn State 
to go to France. And I got oh, to study cool. in Saint Jean de Marion, Je oh. Parle en Français. Okay. And so a little girl from West Philly speaking French and nobody speaks French around me. Crazy. <laughs> but I did that. I came back and I needed an internship for school. And so Penn used to have a program called the Pastoral Care Summer Youth Program where you could work if you were um, a child of an employee in whatever department you wanted. Well, my mentor put me in supply chain. And so wow. I was in supply chain and I was working <laughs> and I was supposed to be there for a few weeks, you know, a month or two doing my thing. And apparently somebody saw something in me. A man by the name of Tom Galazuski was a chief procurement officer um, there. Mm. He called his his subordinate or my boss at the time and said, send Sharon over to the office. So was that like I didn't, terrifying? <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't know I was entering into supply chain right. when I got in supply chain. That's so funny. I came in that Friday. I was jeans on. You know, it's Friday. Yeah. I didn't know I had an interview. Right. Bob says, go over to corporate. First of all, where's corporate? <laughs> <laughs> he said, go get on the shuttle. Go over to corporate. Tom wants to see you. I was like, what? He's like, you got an interview. Print out your resume. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, do what you're told. So I went over there. I sit down. And he's like, yeah. So um, we see what you've been doing. You've been managing the schedules. You've been making sure the inventory is done. We, we think you have a, a knack for this. You, you have a knack for supply chain. So what we're going to do, we're going to start you off as a buyer. We're going to start on Monday. You're going to do half days over there to train your replacement. You're going to start over here in corporate and you'll get a salary. We'll help you pay for school. And you start on Monday. I think you'll do well. Do, do you agree? I was like, uh, uh, <laughs> Do you agree? Uh, <laughs> Can I think about this for a moment? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it'll be a great opportunity for you because, you know, we're going to help you pay for school. And da, 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 da. I was like, okay. Yeah. So, the, and that's how I started in supply chain. I didn't <laughs> know I was starting in supply chain. And from there, I was able to transfer over to Drexel um, University because our offices were in the Bulletin building, the old Bulletin um, building, which was a newspaper. Okay. and uh, back in the day and Drexel was downstairs so I go to class downstairs across the street I was literally right. across from campus so I transferred to Drexel and that's where I finished my college career it was that it was, is amazing it's a journey but, but yeah somebody you know, saw something in me <laughs> but like think about being in that room and he's like it's a good it's good for you it's good for you it's good for you and you're yeah. like um can I just you know like take just I, I am five foot nothing. <laughs> he was a over six foot five gentle giant. <laughs> and it was just like, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. No sure. problem. He's like, such and such is going to train you. And this guy, I was like, okay. <laughs> All right. And we're going to start your career. And that's what started my career oh in my supply gosh. chain. That is amazing. And recently, you began a new role as Director of Supplier Diversity at Radiant. So first, yes. congratulations. Talk Thank to us about you. the role and about uh, Radiant. Well, I made history and Women's History Month, so I was super psyched. Yay. I am their new Director of Supplier Diversity. And in this role, I will be helping to shape their supplier diversity narrative and to build a program nationally in supplier diversity. It's going to be data driven. It's going to be innovative. Yeah. It's going to have initiatives and we are going to knock it out the park because that's what we did. <laughs> hey, I have no doubt in my mind and your passion, your enthusiasm for it is amazing. Now, Supplier diversity is something I talk about quite often because we're still in a position where a lot of particularly large organizations really don't know how to facilitate it successfully. And coming from a small business owner, you know, mm -hmm. underrepresented, mm -hmm. um, I have dealt with a lot of large organizations and it has been a tough go, let me tell you, like yeah. wrought with challenges. So what are the current challenges within supplier diversity from sort of both sides of the coin? Whew. Let's see, we'll put on the corporate hat. So from the corporate hat, you got to realize as an advocate, I'm dealing with challenges both inside our walls and outside our walls right yeah. inside our walls you're you're dealing with what are the sourcing opportunities 
-hmm. What do we want to, to put out there as opportunities? How can we get that information? Outside our walls, we deal with, okay, people are always trying to put stuff in front of us. Here, can people stay here? Got what, right. this, this, this. And I'm like, nice. I'm not ready for that yet. Right. right? Or it's not an opportunity that I know that we have. Mm -hmm. And so from a corporate standpoint, sometimes we're faced with having to delicately tell people no. Right. And it's hard. Yeah. Because y'all just trying to reach out and make money. And, and, and I think yeah. <laughs> years ago when I developed this whole I need to be as honest as possible. There is no opportunity here at mm -hmm. all. Or I may say, let get check back on me in six to six to twelve months. Yeah. It depends. It also depends on the category, the industry, and all that. But then from the supplier perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to get in. Mm -hmm. How do you get in? Who do you connect with? Yeah. You just want a contact. You just want to move forward. You want to present. You want to pitch. Right. Well, here's me, the advocate. I got to bridge that gap yeah. between the corporation mm -hmm. and the supplier. Yeah. And in order for me to do that, I have to position you for success. Right. So I, I oftentimes, and I don't know if you've had this experience, you know, you want to get to this person to pitch to them and I, and I'm that person that says, no, right. It's not, it's not that time. Maybe I know of multiple projects and constraints that they're dealing with that they're not going to pay you any attention. Right, pay you any attention. That's so, so, so true. It's all about timing. Yes. It's about you also knowing internally what they're looking for at the time, what they're not looking for at the time. And I think also when you talk about positioning them for success, you know, even an, uh, an example in my business uh, recently was some, I was, I had to present something at the end of a campaign and Mm -hmm. The way that we were presenting it was a little bit messy and, you know, not at all how we needed to do it for this large organization. And so we went back and forth and sort of talked about it and said, hey, this is what I need in that. This is how I need to present it internally. And now that you've said that, it makes a lot more sense to me why this was happening. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes as a, as a small supplier, right? Um, we get focused on payment terms. We get focused on when are we going to get paid? <laughs> you know, because I've had instances where it's taken a whole year to pay me a thousand dollars and a thousand dollars is not a lot to a large organization, but to a small organization that's get just getting started and may need that thousand dollars to eat is a really, really big deal. So there's a lot of nuances to this. And I think there has to be some grace and some understanding from both sides as to what you're doing as an advocate. Yes. And then how we're thinking about it and what we need to do to maybe level up just a little bit to be that supplier that's going to be and, successful for, for the organization. Once you remember that we're only human. Yeah. <laughs> you be patient with me. I'll be patient with you. Yeah. But realize I'm trying to protect you. Yeah. And I'm also protecting the company. Right. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be engaging with you if I didn't know the company could use your product or service or you weren't best right. in class. Mm -hmm. One. And you wouldn't be engaging with me if you didn't really want the business. But the problem is sometimes there's a disconnect. Oh, and in, a disconnect. in that disconnect, yeah. you don't know about the internal culture of the company that they don't like talking to people. Some of them don't like talking to people. They want right. to go through an intermediary. Some right. people are uncomfortable talking to diverse suppliers. Right. That's why we're here mm -hmm. because we bridge that gap. And when they're uncomfortable, sometimes suppliers don't realize I done had a meeting with them to prep them and position them for yeah. you to tell them about you what you're doing how you doing where you go what's the risk factor yeah. and then I gotta talk to you this is how this person likes to present okay this is on your capability statement don't say this you say this this may trigger something right mm -hmm. <laughs> and this may truly set them off and those small nuances are so critical to success yeah. And it's such like, you just, I, like, a, I just had a light bulb moment, <laughs> how, how important it is in large organizations to have somebody like you have an advocate, have that go between, um, for a successful supplier diversity program without mm -hmm. that, there's just too much work on both sides that it's just going to fall apart because they're like, this isn't worth my time. And they're like, this isn't worth my time. And you know, yeah. and then we don't have successful supplier diversity programs. Like that is why Correct. we do not. Correct. And, and think about 
two organizations ago, I was sitting in the supply chain chair managing contracts, right. saw that we had a need for a supplier diversity lead because yeah. you're telling us the supply chain folks to do this as any other, but this is only a portion of my job. Yeah. And I don't have the tools to do it. You yeah. want me to tell them to report? To report what? To report yeah. where? To do what? Yeah. Who's yeah. going to validate that? And yeah. so I lobby to create that role at that company to handle what supply chain needed mm -hmm. because I knew how to manage the supply chain culture, mm -hmm. the contract management policy and practices, but I also knew what we needed from a supplier diversity side. Mm -hmm. And that's how I became successful in that role because I could bridge that gap and I could speak that language. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think it's such an important distinction and that we talk about it in that particular context. Now, outside of your day job, you are a very busy woman. You're also an author. So tell us about that opportunity. Did you enjoy it? And will you will you write more? So I did enjoy it. Over the pandemic, and I almost missed the cut. So over the pandemic, as a Drexel alum, I would do a lot of virtual events, right? Mm -hmm. So you getting all this and the other. And I got a call one day. It's like, uh, we are doing this book with uh, Black alumni. I think you should be a part of it. I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if anybody would care about my journey. Why, why would I? They were like, but I've heard you speak. And I need, I was like, oh, I don't know. And so we ended up, we actually did a book. So 50 Black alumni from Drexel University did Legacy to Share. Nice. And my chapter, which is ironically on page 154, I grew up on 54 from Webster, West Million House, anyway, uh, <laughs> tells about my journey and everything I, I have gone through in corporate America and my mom and my upbringing. But all proceeds in that book go towards the first ever Black student endowment at Drexel. Awesome. Which I wish they had when I was there, because right, I'm, whew, them lows. But <laughs> but I'm very proud of that. And so mm -hmm. from that, I have two other things that are in the works right now. One is I created an LLC um, and certified it as women owned and minority owned. Nice. So now I understand y'all paying about certification, but yes. I got you. I can understand it. I, I can't. <laughs> I don't just say it. I feel it for you now okay <laughs> anyway so I became a licensed LLC in the WBNB last year as I worked on my book which is advocating for change unapologetically and Yay. it's about my journey thank you and it's all the tips and stuff that I usually put on social media about for diverse suppliers like this is how y'all should connect with us but mm -hmm. don't do this <laughs> yeah right this is how you this is how you should pitch but don't do this, don't do this. I, put, I put that into a book and Love so that. I just wanted to be very transparent, right, about what it takes to connect with us, mm -hmm. but also what it takes so you can actually grow your business. Nice. I love that. I can't wait to read that. I think that's such a good idea. And uh, yeah, just can't wait for that. Now, this is a special episode because we decided to release this episode on Juneteenth. Um, while Sharon is our guest and our feature for Women in Supply Chain, usually we release them on the first Monday of every month, but because this is a very special day and Sharon and I had a good conversation about how we could celebrate this day and celebrate Women in Supply Chain at the same time. And so I'm very happy that we could do this. Now, I want to ask you, Sharon, you know, what does Juneteenth mean to you? So I'm going to be perfectly honest and transparent. I didn't mm. learn about Juneteenth in school mm. at all. But I'm going to give it to you on two contexts. Okay. Juneteenth, which was the holiday that is arguably, sorry for the pug, okay. one of the most important holidays in our nation, just as important as the 4th of July. It commemorates back in 1865. Five, mm -hmm. when the last enslaved person in the state of Texas found out that they were free and that slavery was abolished. And so I teach my children about the history because I learned about it once I got older. Yeah. It, I, 
I would see little brief things pop up because when I first moved back to Philly, I lived in like historic Germantown and they would have Juneteenth celebrations. And I'll be honest, I'd be like, I don't, I don't know what that is. Mm. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, so I need to learn more about what that is. Yeah. And so I actually, the geek in me took my kids to the library, not the Google, the library. I say the library because my mother-in-law was the regional director for the library. So we went to the library yeah. and we pulled some books out to figure it out. And so it is an important day that I want the next generation to know about because yeah. I didn't learn about it in school. Yeah, I didn't learn about it in school either. And I wish that I had. I mean, I didn't learn about it until adulthood. I mean, for me, it's really only been a couple of years. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this in your episode as well is, you know, some people have known about it for a long time, some people mm -hmm. have not. And it's a really important holiday to be able to celebrate and to yes. learn about and to understand. And you're such an advocate of education, that I think that we also need to talk about it in the fact that it needs to be part of education. It needs to be something that we are learning more about on a regular basis and that the next generation doesn't have absolutely. to learn like you and I did, right? Yeah, absolutely. We don't have to go search for it. We don't yeah. have to, we need to make sure that it is known, yeah. right? This is our history. If we don't know our history, mm -hmm. we can't know our future. Yeah. So know your history so that you don't rewrite it. <laughs> yeah. So talk to me about what you're doing on Juneteenth. Cause I think you're doing something All right. amazing. So I'll be golfing on Juneteenth. <laughs> I'll be golfing on Juneteenth, but for a really good cause. So there's a foundation called the TCGI uh, foundation. And that is run by Avis Yates Rivers. And so what Avis is doing is she actually gives a scholarship every year to black women in STEM. Amazing. And so I, last year I was golfing <laughs> on Juneteenth um, in support of that scholarship event. And so I'll be doing the same thing this year. Hopefully I'll be golfing better than I did last year. Um, <laughs> but there are no promises, but I was told to go get some training, but um, I'm going to do that because education is key. But just to um, hit anybody. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm going to try. So that's, that's what, what I'll I be would doing. do. <laughs> That, that is what I'll be doing. So I'll be nice. making sure that I donate to the charity that day and my time yeah. and service and money. So it's a, it's a really good cause. And so what would you like to see more people do um, on Juneteenth? How would you like to see more support, more, more advocacy? Because you're a really big advocate for everybody, you know, in your current role and outside of your role. Yes. You know, we can really see that in this discussion and in the passion. So what would you like to see from other people in, in respect to advocacy when we're talking about Juneteenth? I'd like to see them be very intentional. Mm -hmm. You want to make an economic impact in the communities where you live, work, and serve? Go find a Black-owned business in your community. Go yeah. get to know them. Go spend some money with them. Go figure out what you need to do so you can socialize them on social media. Guess what's free? You can make a post. Right. Guess what's free? You can write a review. Guess what's free? You can refer someone to that business. Mm -hmm. Helping that business grow and make money is a way to make an economic impact where you are and it supports your community. And then maybe if you have time, actually have a conversation mm -hmm. with a black business owner. Yeah. I Take love that, that time to do that. I yeah. love that. Thank you so much for sharing that and being, being part of this, you know, conversation in, in that we can help celebrate right? We can help talk about it. We can help celebrate. Yes. Now talking about advocacy, you're also on a number of boards and committees. I don't even <laughs> yes. know how you find time for that. Um, it's definitely something I'm very passionate about because that's why I started the blended pledge mm -hmm. um, because opportunities for women for underrepresented voices just aren't there at the board level. So why is it so important for women like yourself to pursue these roles and make space and be visible for change? So you can't say you want to change something if you don't want to make sure you're a part of the systems so that need to be changed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I, I want to see change in my community, so I volunteer in my community. And the reason why being on boards is important for me as a Black woman mm -hmm. is I want to be able to have that voice mm. for the community, for diverse businesses, professionals. 
I want to be that voice. And that's important for me because I've walked into boards where I am the only person of color. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you what I say. I'm breaking up the boys club. That's yes. what I said. Because that's what I do. And they're like, wow, she's she, she's different. I am kind of weird. But <laughs> I'm You're okay amazing. with that. Not weird. And it's because I want to see changes that will sustain when my children are able to be out in the workforce mm-hmm. and in the academic uh, world, you know, when they go to college. Right now, they're in grade school, elementary mm-hmm. school. So I want to be a part of creating a legacy mm-hmm. for the next generation. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, seeing somebody like yourself empowers others to yes. be like, wait a second, I can do this too. And there's a lot of really big impacts, a lot of really big change that happens on boards, on committees for nonprofits and things like that. It's one of the reasons why we um, did the blended pledge, right? Is because we want to see more diverse voices on stages. So when the audience is watching them, they can be like, hey, that could be me. I could do that. And And, and uh, I think it's really important. That's important. And it's important to just, you don't know what could come out of being on boards. Mm -hmm. And so so I, this is just this is a shameless plug. So this yeah. is a board I'm on. It's called Healthy News Works. They yeah. turn kids in elementary school and grade school into journalists. So I know you'll appreciate this. Yeah. And last year during the pandemic, we turned the book into a movie. These kids won at the San Diego Film Festival. It's an award-winning journalist in grade school. Amazing. And so that's important because they're in underrepresented communities. Yeah, yeah. Communities that really didn't have the opportunity to talk to professionals that represent them. And they've talked yeah. to Eagles players, doctors, lawyers, mm-hmm. scientists. And so having someone give back to them, mm-hmm. talk to them, give them hope that there are other careers for them is important. And, and show so them what's that's, possible. You turned yes. it into a book, you turned it into a movie. I mean, the fact that you were able to showcase what it means to come together as community and what yes. actually is possible once you just start putting one foot in front of the other, right? Yeah. And opportunity yeah. too. So um, I want to talk to you about your 20 years in supply chain. What have you yep. experienced as a woman? How has the landscape <laughs> of supply chain for women changed from when you first started to now, or has it changed? <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so- <laughs> I've seen supply chain be highly men at the top Mm -hmm. and women are breaking through barriers. I have been blessed and fortunate enough to be mentored by a lot of those women that have been breaking barriers for years. Mm -hmm. Even if they just pulled me to the side and after work would be in the office and they're like, okay, let me show you how to do this. Or you know what, when you're negotiating contracts, learn how to do this. And so I see the landscape changing. Mm -hmm. I also see it evolving. I see more students getting interested in supply chain. I see more schools offering supply chain degrees. I'm like, they ain't had that then. (laughs) And they're like, yes, they did. I was like, no, I remember that. (laughs) Um, But but one of the boards I'm on, um, we do work. So I'm on ISM Philadelphia Institute for Supply Chain Management. And we do a lot of work with both Temple and Drexel supply chain students. And I see those students more and more engaged. So that's the next generation of people who are going to be in supply chain management and who are going to know how to do, you know, P2L, how to do P2P, know about blockchain, know about things that are impacting the industry. Mm -hmm. And I like being a part of that. Like I like being a part of the change. Um, And so I hope that going forward, we continue to make things happen. Yeah, I hope so too. And it's going to take all of us, right? It doesn't take just one person. It takes all of us. And you talked about mentors. So um, something that's come up recently for me is mentors versus sponsors. What is like, do you know what the difference is and what have you had and what has your experience been? All right. So how do I put this? All right. So a mentor involves a formal or informal relationship, right? Okay. With your advisor or peer or role model that you okay. would see, my you would see as a role model. A sponsor mm-hmm. is rather someone that's assigned to guide you or 
okay. that you know can advocate for you when you're not in the room. Okay, cool. So a sponsor is going to be the person who says, who's who's in the boardroom and they're about to do a new, new initiative. And they say, well, you know, Sharon would be the right fit for that role. You should give her that opportunity to mm-hmm. shine and learn about that project or skill. A mentor would be the one to guide you while you try to learn that new skill. Well, I think you should get this training or I think you should go meet this person. I think you should do this or, you know, someone you could bounce ideas off off of um, so you can move your career. Awesome. And so what has your your experience been? Obviously, you've had mentors. Have you had sponsors as well or? I haven't had sponsors. Okay. Per se. I could say some of my old managers have been also sponsors who have advocated for me when Mm -hmm. I'm not in the room, but my mentor database is very diverse. I keep uh, (laughs) mentors who have, who are experts in their own own right in what I do, because, well, I want to learn something. I want to know something. I have one mentor who was an ex vice president um, for a large health organization. I have another mentor who is a senior VP for a large utility company. I have another mentor. I literally have five mentors right now Wow. who I can call on. This is like my career advisory council. Nice. I want to do this, but I, I got a question about this. And they'll say, well, call this one. This is it. Right. I tell them about each other. Like, this is what I need you for. Mm-hmm. I need you to make sure that you hone in on these skills or I need you to tell me when I'm doing this wrong. Mm -hmm. Like I I need somebody to pull my coattails on that. And so those different faces from all walks of life, Mm -hmm. there are men, women, they are uh, married, single, and some of them even um, identify with the LGBTQ community. So have a diverse group of mentors because you're going to have a diverse set of perspectives That's that you would not have thought advice. about. Yeah. It's such great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Now I was going to ask you what advice you would share for women to wanting to follow in your footsteps, but that sounds like really good advice. So maybe the other question is um, what can, what advice would you have to organizations that are looking to support more women, more diversity and inclusion in their workplace? If you want to support them, can you get up and do something? Like, don't just <laughs> say you want to do it. Like people, I love when people talk the talk, but okay, you want to do it? Walk the walk. Right. Contact the supplier diversity folks. Go to an event with them. Like I kind of have to plead and beg people. Mm-hmm. I, not, and I'm sorry, let me, let me put it in. I influence change <laughs> by making sure <laughs> that they feel as though coming to the event is impactful for them. Mm -hmm. And it can benefit them and their role and responsibilities. Otherwise, I tell them, listen, this is what you need to do. You say you want to do something. You want to help women go go to the women-owned events. Mm -hmm. Participate in them. You say you want to support the LGBT community. Go to the NGLCC events. Support those. You say you want to help the minority-owned community. Go to the NMSTC affiliate events. Mm -hmm. Go to your local chambers, councils. See how you can volunteer, how you can help. Services in kind, even giving advice and mentoring or tutelage to suppliers is also a way of giving back. Yes. But I, I want to see people act, yes. not just say. We need some action, people. Take yes. some action today. Do not wait till tomorrow. Um, so finally, I mean, I think you and I could talk for hours. What is, what does the rest of your journey look like? What do the next steps, what does the future look like for you? What are you excited about? What am I excited about this year? Well, my my baby's graduating in a few weeks, so I'm I'm excited about that. Um, He's going to high school. I'm excited about this journey here at this new company and building this program and making sure that the ecosystem for all of the supply chain uh, folks is diversified. I want to make sure that we have the training um, in place internally and externally. Yeah. Like I still want to make sure everyone knows what supplier diversity is. It's not just a buzzword. It's an action. And, and I also want to make sure that I can grow like Mm -hmm. outside of work. I'm going to grow. I'm putting myself 
setting the timeline. I am pushing that book out. Uh, I am going to make sure I get that done. I am going to renew my certification. So if anybody from the councils are looking, I saw the email. It's coming. I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do that and, and possibly, you know, probably get my kids involved in the children's book that I'm writing. So and I'm just going to keep going positive strides. Yes, I love it. You are absolutely fascinating. And I cannot wait for you to be on an upcoming episode of Blended. I don't know about all of you listening, but I'm totally buzzing after this conversation. Sharon is such an inspiration, an amazing oh. example of what hard work, ambition, and dedication can really achieve. And today is a day of celebration. And Sharon, I just want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share in that with you and to be able to highlight your journey and for you to come on unapologetically and speak the truth, speak from the heart. And uh, we need more people like you in supply chain. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you are very welcome. This is this is awesome. Like you're a rock star. You're a rock star, right? <laughs> I, I'm a supply chain geek. So I follow mentors and podcasts and articles for people who are actually turning the tide and making sure the next generation is educated. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for keeping up with all these supply chain trends and having these podcasts to talk about them. And thank you for inviting me on the show. <laughs> 